Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Chonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I am really excited to be here today with Dr. Michael Sandbank. Um, before I introduce her, just to go over our usual housekeeping notes is that we are live on YouTube right now. Um, the recording is available to watch at any time. We will have both Spanish and English subtitles, and we will also have a transcript. Um, and um, we always encourage you to ask questions, introduce yourself. If you're comfortable, tell us a little about yourself. Um, and um, just remember that in order to do that, you will have to be logged into your YouTube account. So uh, now I'm happy to introduce Dr. Michael Sandbank, who is an internationally recognized expert on early childhood interventions for young children on the autism spectrum. She's the lead researcher on Project AIM, which was a scoping systematic review and meta-analysis of all group design studies of interventions for young children on the spectrum. She was awarded the INSAR Young Investigator Award in 2021 for this work. Dr. Sandbank has shaped the development of international autism early intervention recommendations as a member of the WHO UNICEF expert working group. She's also the director of the Brain and Language Lab and is interested in the use of neural measures of speech processing to identify clinically useful practices for language intervention for young children with disabilities. Her research is informed by her past experiences working as a special educator and private clinician. Welcome, Dr. Sandbank. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and um, share my screen and we'll uh, talk about, you know, what we're here to talk about today. Um, so I wanted to uh, speak today about um, findings from Project AIM, so that uh, work that Jen just mentioned, um, and just really kind of give an overview of everything we've learned from our research about interventions that were designed to support children on the autism spectrum. Um, so the context for this really starts with a consideration of what are the common recommendations made for intervention um, for young children on the autism spectrum that are currently kind of made. So it's very commonly recommended that intervention begins early in life um, at two or even in case sometimes before a diagnosis is provided. Um, it's recommended that interventions start. Um, interventions are supposed to be comprehensive, meaning they target broader learning across domains rather than being really narrowly focused on specific behaviors. Um, and it's also recommended that interventions are intensive, or it's very commonly recommended that interventions are intensive. So being provided for as much as 25 to 40 hours per week, which is a lot for a young child um, in terms of their time and for a family. So what's the nature of the evidence base supporting these recommendations? So Project AIM was really motivated um, by sort of uh, a few events that kind of happened. So in 2011, Warren and colleagues put out a systematic review that was published in the journal Pediatrics, um, where they looked at um, studies of early interventions for young children on the autism spectrum. And they found only two high quality randomized control trials. So they found a total of 34 group design studies, but when they assessed them on quality and um, uh, separated them based on study design, um, they sort of found that only two of them were high quality randomized control trials testing the effectiveness of early intervention. So that's not a lot. And we're looking at, you know, sort of in 2011, this is the state of the evidence base. Then in 2017, French and Kennedy published another review, another systematic review of early interventions, and they found at least 48 randomized control trials testing the effectiveness of early childhood interventions for the same population. Um, so this is a, a really drastic increase. This is sort of a, a tidal wave of publications. Um, so it was apparent that there is this transformation of the evidence base or this new evidence base. Um, so we really wanted to, to find out what does this evidence base say? And I thought to myself, well, this is a job for meta-analysis because meta-analysis allows us to quantify how effective a given intervention is um, and to sort of look across multiple studies and see you know what what is the evidence uh, for how effective a given intervention is um, and the way that we do this is uh, every single study that compares uh, that tests an intervention between a a group that receives the intervention the intervention group and a comparison group can actually quantify the size of the effect or the magnitude of the effect. And this is really just the difference between 
the intervention group and the comparison group at the end of the study after one group has received this intervention and the other group hasn't, um, that is the difference um, that we quantify as an effect size. And we can reflect that difference on a forest plot. So I'm gonna orient you to this, um, which is a forest plot because that's gonna be helpful for understanding the rest of our findings. Um, so this is a forest plot and this line right here, this represents the zero line. Um, so anything on this line means there was zero effect. That means that the end of intervention after one group received the intervention and another group didn't, the two groups had zero difference between them, meaning there was no difference. The intervention had no effect, essentially. Um, if the square is on this side, um, that means that the intervention group at the end of intervention is doing better than the comparison group um, on the outcome that's being measured. And then if the square is on this side, that means that the comparison group is doing better than the intervention group at the end of the intervention. So in this case, this would be evidence that the intervention actually had a negative effect um, on, on the intervention group, on the specific outcome that was being measured. So we want our squares to be on this side um, because we want interventions to have positive effects. And then you see these bars kind of going through each square. This is our confidence interval. So this is telling us sort of um, how, how precise is our estimate of intervention effectiveness? So really small studies are not very precise at estimating the effects of intervention. And so they get very big confidence intervals. It means this was our observed intervention effect, but if we repeated this study a thousand times, you know, 90 or a hundred times, let's say, 95% of our estimates would kind of fall within this range. So we want a smaller range. We want these smaller little uh, confidence intervals um, because that sort of gives us confidence that our estimate of intervention effectiveness was really precise. And when these confidence intervals, when these lines don't cross over the zero line, we can say that that was a significant effect. So it's significantly different from zero. So this is how we can kind of look at you know, and graph what are the effects of interventions on given outcomes and get kind of a quantification of it. Um, and that allows us to ask how effective are different intervention approaches for improving different outcomes? Because there are a lot of interventions that are commonly provided to children on the autism spectrum. So behavioral interventions are very commonly recommended and provided. Developmental interventions are also recommended. We have this new category of intervention called naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions that blend um, theory and philosophy from both behavioral and developmental um, practices, but they have declared themselves a different category of intervention. Sensory-based interventions are very commonly provided to children on the autism spectrum. We've also seen some representation of TEACH in the literature, which is an intervention that was developed in uh, North Carolina, but is often kind of used uh, more internationally. And then technology-based interventions are common as well. So these are interventions that um, are entirely mediated through technology, um, like, for example, through computers or video media um, or something, you know, kind of of that nature. And then there are a variety of outcomes that are often targeted or supported in these uh, interventions. So adaptive outcomes, sort of how children are navigating their daily lives and doing activities of daily living, like getting dressed, brushing teeth, anything they really need to do to navigate their environment. Cognitive outcomes are very commonly measured in these studies and supported. Um, language outcomes, so are children using language to communicate? Are they understanding language? Social communication, are they doing all of those sort of other things that go along with expressing the messages they're trying to communicate? Um, and are they understanding those other things as well? Social emotional outcomes, and then the core challenges that tend to accompany uh, an autism diagnosis. So this is, can be challenges with social communication as well as really restrictive um, interests or um, uh, a, a need for routine um, or repetitive behaviors that are very common, commonly used. Um, so what about quality? Because we can look at the impact or the effect of an intervention on a given outcome, but does quality of the study influence our estimate of intervention effectiveness? So there's a lot of things we do in studies to ensure that the estimate that we're getting about how effective our intervention is, is a good and precise estimate. Um, things like random assignments. So we wanna make sure that participants are randomly assigned to the intervention group and the comparison group so that when there are differences observed at the end of the study, we can tell that that difference is really attributable to the 
intervention and not to some other difference that was already present between the groups. Were the assessors masked? Were they, were they unaware of which group the participant was assigned to when, when, when they were assessing the outcome, both at the beginning of the intervention and at the end of the intervention? Because if they're not, and then they're aware that a participant has received an intervention or the participant hasn't received an intervention, this can influence their assessment. Even if that assessment is a standardized assessment with a very strict protocol, there are subjective judgments that are made or just changes in how they administer the assessment that can happen subconsciously and that can influence uh, our, the scores on the assessment. Were the measures direct measures? So they, were they directly measured or assessed from either observation of the child or administration by an assessor? Or are they primarily derived from caregiver or teacher report? Because caregivers and teachers are experts on child on the children that they're working with or that they that they have and their development but they also are invested in the outcome of the intervention and they're also aware about whether or not the child has received an intervention and so those two uh, forces kind of can come together to influence a parent or caregiver or teacher's perception of how the child is performing now. Um, and so that could potentially uh, threaten the accuracy of the estimate about how the child is doing um, at the end of a study. And then what about participant retention? Are the overwhelming majority of the participants remaining in the study throughout all the assessment points? Because if a large portion of participants are leaving, for example, if the participants who find the intervention not supportive and not helpful are leaving, then only the ones who do find the intervention to be effective and helpful are staying. And that's going to influence our perception of how the effective, how effective the intervention is. So these are all sort of quality, basic quality controls that we want to have in studies. Um, and we care about, you know, does this influence the estimate of intervention effectiveness? Because essentially what will happen is if we don't have basic quality controls in place, our estimates will be biased and they will likely be positively biased, meaning we'll get a really, really good estimate of a positive estimate of intervention effectiveness, um, but it won't necessarily be precise or accurate. Um, it will be kind of pushed by the low quality of the study. We also want to think about the outcomes. So how do we think about the learning that extends beyond the intervention, not just from beyond the intervention targets, but also the intervention context. And a lot of scholars, psychologists have talked about this idea of what we're measuring and how we're measuring learning that extends beyond the intervention. So sometimes psychologists refer to it as near transfer or far transfer. Developmental psychologists often talk about proximal or distal outcomes. Um, and uh, education scholars often talk about generalization. So these are all terms that have been kind of used to try to describe this idea of learning, whether or not an intervention affects learning that extends beyond the scope of the intervention itself. Um, so uh, behavioralists have talked a lot about this idea, um, and they talk about setting and stimulus generalization. So this is whether or not uh, a learning that is, that is affected by an intervention um, extends to different people, so different interaction partners. So if I learn to use um, certain words to communicate, can I use those words um, not just with the person who taught me, but with other people, with, with grandma, with whoever kind of is in my other spheres? Or different settings, can I use uh, my words at home and at school? Um, or with different materials, can I talk about, you know, a variety of different items that are relevant to my daily life? Um, that would be setting stimulus generalization. And then response generalization is using different behaviors that weren't directly targeted in the intervention. We use some different terms to describe um, this, and we think of these two concepts as related, um, but distinct. So whether or not uh, learning from an intervention extends beyond the exact uh, context of the intervention, we refer to this as boundedness. So context-bound outcomes are outcomes that do not extend beyond the context of the intervention. They are measured with the same people in the same setting, with the same materials, um, and with the same interaction style that was used in the intervention. So a highly structured intervention, having a highly structured interaction style in the assessment would be context-bound. Um, and the more we kind of change these different dimensions 
uh, of difference. The more difference we can get between our intervention context and our assessment context, that increases the likelihood that that outcome of that intervention is generalized. Um, so having being measured in in context with different people in different settings and different materials and different interaction styles. So to give an example that kind of to help us get our minds around what, what we're talking about here. We can think of a hypothetical intervention. Um, there's an intervention called focus stimulation. This is a play-based intervention where uh, an interventionist, usually a clinician, like a speech language pathologist, is trying to teach a child um, uh, either new vocabulary and new grammatical forms. And the way that they do that is by having kind of a, a 10 to 20 minute play context where they model the the new vocabulary or the new forms as much as they can so let's say this clinician is trying to teach a child to use new words they model these words a lot in play but they're not actually going to make the child say these words at all they're just going to model them as much as possible the context for this intervention is with a speech language pathologist so that's who the child is playing with in a setting let's say it's a clinic that's a very common setting for this intervention with certain materials like toys that are very common at a, at a speech language pathologist clinic, which would be like little people, like the little people farm set. This is a very common, if you're in early childhood, you know about you know all the toys and which toys are the most fun to kind of interact with, right? So let's say that's the, the materials used for this specific intervention. And then the interaction style is very play-based and child-led, even though the clinician is trying to model these specific words as much as possible, they're following the child's lead and playing with what the child wants to play with and how they want to play with it. Um, so this, all of these dimensions describe the intervention context. So if we were to assess the outcome, um, which is the child's use of these 10 words um, in a context-bound assessment context. Um, if we were to assess very context-bound learning, we would assess that learning in the exact same context. So we would see, for example, how often the child uses these words in an interaction, in a play-based interaction with the speech language pathologist in their clinic um, and with the little people farm set or something similar, very similar toys. Um, and even if that was happening outside of the intervention, so let's say our speech language pathologist isn't modeling those words, we're just kind of playing, that still is the same context of the intervention. If we wanted to get away from that context a, a, a little bit, we might change one of those dimensions. So we might have the interaction partner be a parent. The parent comes into the clinic, they're playing with the child in a very play-based and child-led way. Um, they're using the same little people farm set, um, but we're seeing how often or how much the child is using these 10 words that were modeled very heavily. That would still likely be a context-bound assessment context, because even though we've changed one dimension, the interaction partner, we're still keeping a lot of the other contextual dimensions in place and the same. We really start to get closer to generalized when we change more than one dimension. So let's change the setting. So now our interaction partner is the parent, and now they're going to be in the home. It's a completely different, a meaningfully different setting. Um, they're still using the same materials, and they're still using the same interaction style. If we wanted to get really highly generalized, we would change all of these dimensions. So we might have our interaction partners be other children, our setting be the preschool, the materials being the kitchen toys or something that would be, you know, in a, in a center, in an early childhood center in, in the preschool. Um, and then the interaction style would be group play, child play. Um, so this would be a very different context. If we were to look into this context and see how often the child who received this focus stimulation intervention used these 10 words, that, and we saw that they did use them, that would be evidence that their learning from that intervention was highly generalized. It extended to relevant but different contexts um, with their learning. So it's extended past the context of intervention. So we can also think about our outcomes when we think about the targets that we're assessing. Um, and we talk about this as being the proximity of the outcomes we're assessing. So if we, accept, if we assess the exact targets of the intervention that were, that were taught in the intervention, we would say that's highly proximal. 
If we were to assess similar non-targets, we would say that's still pretty proximal. But when we get beyond those targets um, and assess broad change within the domain of, of development, or even further than that, if we assess change that extends to another domain, we would call that distal or highly distal or very distal. So I'll go back to our example before to try to help us figure out what this was. So in our focus stimulation intervention, our, our therapist was modeling 10 words as much as they possibly could. So uh, an assessment of the exact targets of the intervention, meaning those 10 specific words, the number of the targeted words said, that would be an overly or very proximal outcome. We could kind of expand a little bit beyond the intervention. It would still be proximal, but if we just assessed any number of words that they said, so the words that they said just in general, that would be a proximal outcome because we're still looking at vocabulary um, and uh, specifically expressive vocabulary, um, but uh, it's not just the vocabulary that was directly modeled. So still proximal, but a little bit more extended beyond the intervention. But if we really want to get to a distal outcome, we might ass assess whether this intervention had an impact on language in general. So not just the use of words, but also um, gram grammar or, you know, are they using longer utterances or things like that, right? So they're getting more and more complex um, speech and language. Um, a developmentally scaled language assessment would be an outcome that would tell us if this intervention impacted broad change within this domain of language. Um, and then a really distal outcome, a very distal outcome would be uh, an assessment of broad change within an adjacent domain or across domain. So if we saw that this intervention impacted cognition and we saw improvements in a cognitive assessment, that would be a very distal outcome for our intervention. So that was a lot, um, but the point that I wanna make is that um, our learning that extends far beyond the context and targets of intervention reflects changes in development. And that development is highly meaningful change. So what we measure, whether we're measuring sort of very narrow change or you know, very broad change, is going to um, reflect kind of different levels uh, of meaningfulness uh, for the child who's receiving that intervention. Um, but does that impact how we perceive effects in autism intervention research? So does, does the, the scope of the outcome that we're measuring influence uh, our our estimates of intervention effectiveness in autism intervention research. So this is the full context uh, that led Project AIM. Um, and Project AIM, AIM stands for Autism Intervention Meta-Analysis. It was led by myself um, and my lab, the Brain and Language Lab, um, as well with our co-leaders uh, at Boston College and the ACER Lab, Kristen Bottom of Boutel, um, and the BAND Lab led by Tiffany Wojnarowski at uh, Vanderbilt University. So Project AIM is comprehensive. We identified all group design studies of all interventions um, for, uh, for any outcome for children on the autism spectrum up to age eight, as long as they featured an intervention group and a comparison group. That was important not only for control, but also because we really can't compare studies that don't have those attributes uh, across each other. We were systematic. So we systematically reviewed those studies in terms of quality. We coded all of those studies for specific participant and intervention and outcome characteristics. Um, and we were meta-analytic. So meta-analysis allowed us to estimate the overall effect of different intervention approaches for these different types of outcomes that we spoke about. And this is ongoing. So now that we've estimated overall effects, we're also examining participant intervention, uh, participant and intervention characteristics that influence intervention effectiveness for different outcomes. So we can understand um, not only is an intervention effective, but how is it effect how effective is it for different kinds of participants, um, and how effective is it depending on different kinds of aspects of the intervention. So we tried to search for studies that included young children who were um, up to age eight, um, who uh, were autistic, had a diagnosis of autism or something that would be considered an autism spectrum disorder. Um, they were only studies of non-pharmacological interventions. So um, someone might describe these as behavioral interventions, meaning that they targeted changes in behavior or improvements in outcomes. They weren't necessarily like drug therapies or something like that. Um, and then they had a usual treatment or a comparison group. Um, 
or a control group that was included in the study. So we found, uh, I think when we did our search, we got 12,000 citations that we had to screen through. Um, and so we screened through that. It was a big effort. And when the dust settled, we had 150 reports of 130 different studies. 87 of those studies were randomized controlled trials. Um, and then across all of the studies, we had 6,240 participants represented and 1,615 effect sizes rep represented, meaning that there were that many different outcomes that were measured across all of the studies. And that paper is published in the journal Psychological Bulletin. And I have a link here that um, reflects where it can be accessed in full. So our first question was, what are the effects of different interventions on different outcomes? And we looked at these interventions. These were what were represented in our studies. Um, so we tried to uh, generate effect sizes for, for any intervention that had enough representation in our study set. Um, and then these were the outcomes that were represented in our study. Again, we tried to generate effect sizes for any outcome that had enough representation in our data set. Um, so when we look across all of the studies and we include all of the studies, this is what we find. So we divided our interventions by these different categories of intervention approach, and then we divided our outcomes by the different kinds of outcomes, um, the domains of outcomes that were targeted. Um, and so you can see overall, we see pretty positive estimates of intervention effectiveness across these different kinds of interventions. Um, but some of them that are not significant, where we can see these error bars kind of go over that zero line, and one that actually ends up being negative, um, though it's a very imprecise estimate, because there's not very many studies um, uh, and outcomes represented in that intervention effect. But then we wanted to ask ourselves, okay, but what about quality? So is quality influencing these estimates of intervention effectiveness? So the first thing we wanted to do was say, okay, well, if we just look at the studies that in which participants were randomly assigned. Um, so this is kind of an important and basic quality indicator. And we restricted our studies just to those studies that were randomized controlled trials. And then we estimated our summary effects again, just with those RCTs. And you'll notice that a lot of effect sizes go away. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have evidence that it has no effect or a negative effect. It means we don't have evidence. We don't have randomized controlled trials, enough of them, to um, show the effect of that intervention on a given outcome. So we don't have kind of controlled tests um, there. So we do still see, we do still have some effect size estimates, um, but you'll also see that some of these effect estimates have gone down a little bit um, where they were previously significant and then now they're crossing um, the zero line. And then we said, okay, what if we restrict just to direct assessments uh, of the participants, meaning it was derived either through an assessment administered by an assessor um, or through an observation, but not necessarily from a teacher or caregiver report. When we further restrict um, to just direct assessments, exclude caregiver report or teacher report outcomes, um, we see another uh, uh, couple of, of effect sizes drop out, and we also see the effect sizes kind of move closer towards the zero line. Then we said, well, let's get rid of all of the outcomes where detection bias is not high. That means where our assessors were unaware of which group the participant was uh, assigned to. The assessors, the people coding the outcomes, the people participating in the assessments, all of those folks had to be masked um, or unaware of which group the participants were assigned to, um, because that can subconsciously influence the scores on, on these outcomes. When we did that, you can see even more effect sizes drop out. We can only estimate two effect sizes, um, and neither of them are significant. Both of them cross the zero line. So this is not good. Basically, as we sort of increasingly um, apply higher quality standards to our studies of interventions, we see that we kind of run out of studies um, that really meet that standard or that bar. So what we can learn from this is that low quality studies are falsely inflating our estimates of intervention effectiveness. And this is happening across interventions and it's happening across outcomes. Um, so that you know, was our first kind of finding that we wanted to put forth in that paper. 
But what about learning that extends beyond the intervention? So how effective are our interventions for improving generalized and distal outcomes? How effective are they for kind of teaching learning that gets beyond the direct intervention context and beyond the direct intervention targets? And then are our estimates of intervention effectiveness influenced by what we choose to measure? If we're, you know, if we choose to measure a very proximal context bound outcome, you know, do we see a bigger intervention effect than if we uh, choose to measure a more distal and generalized outcome? So here's the breakdown when we categorize our outcomes as either context bound or generalized or potentially context bound. This is what we saw and this is across all 1,615 outcomes in terms of the kinds of outcomes that were measured. And so then we can look within each of these and this is happening across intervention and across outcome and just say, what's the general intervention effect on generalized outcomes versus context bound outcomes versus potentially context bound outcomes. And here we see that while we're in general across interventions and outcomes, seeing positive effects on, you know, all of these different outcomes in our studies, um, you know, not accounting for quality, we see that it really differs by the kind of outcome we're measuring. So we have greater effects for these context-bound outcomes or more positive effects for context-bound outcomes. Um, and then as we get a little bit further from the context of intervention, uh, we see uh, lower effects. And then if we get to generalized outcomes, we see even lower effects. Um, and so this really shows us that that boundedness of the outcome that we choose to measure is affecting our estimates of intervention effectiveness. What about proximity? So here's the breakdown of uh, when we look across all of the outcomes, if they're distal or proximal. Um, and then we can compute summary effect sizes or estimates of intervention effectiveness for the proximal outcomes versus the distal outcomes. And when we look at that, again, we see that when we assess very proximal targets, when we assess exactly what we taught directly modeled in the intervention, we get a higher effect estimate than what we measured, uh, than what we get if we assess something that wasn't directly taught or modeled in the intervention. So we can interpret these findings in two ways. So one, interventions are better at improving targeted specific learning in the immediate context than they are at affecting generalized developmental change. But two, our beliefs about intervention effectiveness are influenced by what we choose to measure. What we measure in research influences how effective we think an intervention is. So if we measure very, very proximal, very context bound outcomes, we're gonna get this really huge effect uh, for our intervention. But then we have to ask ourselves, is that a meaningful change? Um, or is it a change that is so narrow and specific that it's not likely to really improve a whole lot for that child and family's life? So let's revisit those common intervention recommendations. So we talked about the recommendation that intervention began really early in life and intervention began, be really intensive or provided for these really, really um, large numbers of hours per week. So this is, these are questions we can look at with meta-analysis as well. And we have this special tool that we use called meta-regression. Um, and so with meta-regression, we're gonna see whether there's an association between these variables and intervention effectiveness as well. So the first one we want to look at, look at is this uh, early recommendation. So the way we can look at this with meta-regression is by asking, does participant age moderate intervention effects? Meaning if we look at the ages of the participants in the studies, we're going to see a lot of variability across studies, at least within our age range, because we included up to age eight. Um, if we look at that participant age, do we see different effects for younger children versus older children um, within the, or, you know, across those studies? Um, and what we found, oh, we should go, oh, sorry, I'm so confused for a second. I thought I was anticipating a different slide, but I don't have it. So when we looked at that, what we found was that participant age does not significantly moderate intervention effects on language, play, adaptive behavior or cognitive scores. And so these are just the, the findings that we've looked at 
Um, we've also looked within specific interventions and we haven't found a moderating effect of participant age. So theoretically, if earlier is better, what we would expect to see is that we'd have larger effect sizes for, for studies in which participants were younger um, compared to studies in which participants are older. But we're not seeing that association uh, at all, which doesn't mean that it's not true, but it does mean we don't have super strong evidence for it. We're not finding evidence for it when we look at all of the studies. So this means that advancing age doesn't place a ceiling on the progress that can be made with intervention, at least up to age eight. Um, and so that's good. That's good. We don't have to do this, this you know, tell families that, you know, we have to get into an intervention right away because the progress that can be made, the learning that can happen is going to diminish as the child ages. That doesn't mean that very young children can't improve with intervention um, or supports. Certainly, we have studies of very young children that were represented in Project AIM where we saw great improvements and gains. Um, and it doesn't mean that very young children shouldn't get the support they need. But it does mean we need to temper this message about effects waning um, or intervention being less effective as children age because we don't see strong evidence for that. What about intervention intensity? So um, often very intensive interventions are recommended um, when children get a diagnosis. And so we can look at this as well with meta-regression and see does the total amount of intervention provided moderate intervention effects because across studies we see different amounts of intervention that are provided and theoretically if intervention intensity was important um, was a moderating uh, variable what we would see is that studies of interventions that had higher intensities would show larger effects than studies of interventions that had lower intensities if we thought that intensity was sort of a key thing driving intervention effects. Um, so first we need to talk about what we mean by intervention intensity, because I think that term um, and dosage is used a lot, um, but to mean variable things. So dose is what is the term we use to refer to the number of teaching episodes or the time that makes up a teaching session. So for example, 30 minutes. If that's one session of teaching or intervention, that would be the dose. The dose frequency is the number of times an intervention is provided per day, per week. So for example, if we're getting 30 hours per week of that you know, 30 minute intervention session, that would be the dose frequency. The total intervention duration is the total amount of time that the intervention is provided. So for example, two years is a common uh, amount, a uh, duration of intervention that's recommended, if not longer. Um, and then the cumulative intervention intensity is the combination of all of those things. So if we take the dose times the dose frequency times the total intervention duration, what we get is an estimate of the total amount of intervention that a child gets. And we can look at that across study if the study reported enough information. So that is what we looked at. If they reported enough information, could we extract uh, a number to describe the total amount of intervention they received across the course of the study in hours. Um, so that's what we were looking at. But we also want to keep in mind that this might vary by uh, intervention approach. And we have theoretical reasons to, to look at it within different interventions, especially because it's very, very common um, for behavioral interventions. Um, it's very commonly said that, that they will not be effective unless they're provided at these high intensities. Certainly, early intensive behavioral intervention, the intensity is, a, is, is such a key part of that intervention package that it's part of the name, right? Um, and so uh, we wanted to look at this not just across interventions, but really within intervention approach, um, because the, the theory about whether intensity matters really varies by the intervention approach. So how are we going to look at this? So we're using meta-regression again, but I just kind of want to orient you to the way we would expect this to kind of plot out. So this is a bubble plot, and this is how we're going to examine this, the way that we kind of looked at our forest plots earlier. So Hedges G right here is the uh, effect size. Um, and so this is our zero line again, like we saw our zero line before, meaning that bubbles that fall along this zero line are going to re represent no difference between the intervention and the comparison group at the end of the study. We want our bubbles to be up here. That represents that the intervention group is doing better than the comparison group at the end of the study. Um, and then if the bubbles are down here, that means that the um, 
comparison group is doing better than the intervention group at the end of the study. And then along this axis, we have how much intervention children are receiving. Um, so we had in some cases really high amounts of intervention. Keep in mind that this can be, you know, some studies were the, over the course of several years, but certainly for studies where participants were receiving 20 to 40 hours per week of intervention for two to three years, we're getting up to kind of 6,000 hours of uh, total intervention that was provided to the participants in the study. So if these two things were related, what we're looking to see is that there's some sort of diagonal line. And if it's increasing, that, mean, that means that, um, that more intense interventions are, are yielding uh, greater effects. And if it's decreasing, we're seeing that less intensive interventions are yielding greater effects. And when you see a lot of bubbles on the same line, those are outcomes from the same study, um, meaning, you know, in a given study, the participants were given a, a specific intervention at a specific intensity, and several outcomes were uh, assessed, maybe a language outcome and a social communication outcome and an adaptive outcome, right? So we would see multiple bubbles. And then the size of the bubbles, you'll notice those are also different. That represents how big the study is, meaning how many participants were in the study. We want to give more weight to studies with more participants because they generate more precise estimates. So that's our bubble plot that we're going to be looking at to ask this question. And this is actually the bubble plot for behavioral intervention. So when we look just with behavior, within behavioral interventions, we found that cumulative intervention intensity does not significantly moderate the intervention effects for behavioral intervention. So we don't see that um, higher intensity interventions yield uh, overwhelmingly more positive effects um, or really different effects at all than lower intensity behavioral interventions, even very low intensity behavioral interventions. We can also look at this within developmental interventions. Um, so here we see fewer studies. There are fewer studies of developmental interventions, but there were also um, fewer studies for which we could derive uh, an estimate of how much intervention the child got just because reporting standards really vary. But you'll also notice that the bubbles are a lot bigger because the studies that we do have are a lot larger um, for these interventions. But here again, we find that the cumulative intervention intensity doesn't really significantly moderate our developmental intervention effects. So we're not seeing different intervention effects by the amount of intervention that the children got, even within developmental interventions. We can also look at this within NDVIs. Um, and so this is that newer category of intervention that is kind of blended and be combines behavioral and developmental theory. Um, and here again, we don't see that cumulative intervention intensity um, significantly moderates, uh, sorry, say, should say NDVI intervention effects. So, more intensive intervention is not unilaterally better than less. At least that's what we're not finding evidence when we look across studies and when we zoom out and kind of consider evidence in its totality, we're not seeing that more intensive intervention is unilaterally, unilaterally better than less. Okay, so what does moderate intervention effectiveness? Have we found anything where we see a moderating, moderating effect? So we have. Um, one is intervention implementer, so who is providing the intervention to the child, and the other thing is participant language ability. So how much uh, language ability or language skills do they have when they enter intervention? These are things that have come up uh, as moderators in our analyses. So the intervention implementer um, is, you know, we have a variety of uh, intervention agents that would be um, interacting with children and sort of supporting them in their daily life. So caregivers are familiar to children, they support them in the natural environment. So ideally, they'd be really good um, uh, folks to kind of mediate these supports because um, they are so familiar and they're likely to kind of promote learning that's going to generalize across a lot of relevant contexts. Clinicians are very common um, interventionists. They're not familiar to the child, so that's not great. Um, they can become familiar with the child if they develop a good relationship, but they are skilled and trained professionals, and hopefully they have a good understanding of early development that might, you know, make them, you know, uh, particularly skilled at supporting young children. Um, some interventions use a combination of intervention uh, interventionists where they kind of can leverage the benefits of all of the different kinds of intervention 
agents. Um, but the difficulty there is that there has to be good collaboration between those intervention partners. Um, and then educators also support children in the classroom and the education or the classroom has very specific um, uh, standards and needs and things that you're working on that are different from what you're learning at home. And so educators, you know, they know about those things. They know about those teaching targets and those objectives, um, and they might be particularly skilled um, at supporting children in those environments. And then technology is also a an intervention agent. Um, we have a few uh, interventions where they were fully mediated by technology and that can be beneficial because a lot of autistic folks have reported that they like technological interventions because technology is uh, predictable and it's self-paced, right? So there's a variety of reasons that we might expect intervention effects to differ by the different implementers. And it's also possible that this varies within domain of outcome. So we may see that one kind of intervention agent is more effective for supporting a child at improving in one kind of skill, whereas when we think about another kind of skill, another intervention agent might be more effective. So we have looked at this in these specific domains, in our language outcomes, in our play outcomes, in adaptive behavior, and in our cognitive outcomes. So we found that in adaptive outcomes, we see that there is a moderating, moderating effect of intervention agent. And we do see that clinicians seem particularly more able or interventions administered by clinicians um, are uh, showing higher effects um, than interventions that are uh, administered by caregivers or a combination of interventionists. When we look at cognitive outcomes, we see that same relationship. So clinicians seem to be particularly skilled at supporting uh, cognitive outcomes relative to caregivers or even combination interventions. Educator interventions, uh, educator-led interventions have kind of a similarly high effect size, but you can see that there's less studies represented. And so that estimate is not quite as precise. So we see these really large error bars, um, which is a, you know, a challenge in interpreting this data. For our language outcomes, we see that clinicians are particularly good at supporting language outcomes, but so are combination interventions. So clinicians working with caregivers and with educators to support language development sort of across a range of contexts. This seems to be the most uh, effective approach. So our other thing that we found as a potential moderator is the language ability of the child. Um, and we found that language age at the study, language age is um, a measure that we were able to sort of pull as a score of um, how advanced a child's language ability is when they enter the intervention. Um, and we found that that language ability sort of governs whether or not they benefit from intervention supporting um, language. Um, so their ability to speak or understand language or both, as well as interventions that are supporting cognition. And those are usually measured by, you know, measures of intelligence or cognitive development that are standardized. Um, so here we see the bubble plot, and you can see that line, because I've drawn it in for you, that as children um, enter, if they enter intervention with sort of greater language skills, that those interventions are more effective, meaning they kind of have a developmental foundation that helps them to benefit from the intervention. It helps the intervention to be useful for them um, more than if they entered it with you know, fewer language skills. So this tells us we might want to um, you know, support language skills before we kind of provide as like a prerequisite before we're providing these different kinds of interventions to help them be more effective. And similarly, we see that same association with um, language ability and the intervention effects on cognitive outcomes. Um, and so again, it's providing that developmental uh, foundation. And we've looked at whether or not this is associated with cognitive scores. So we might expect that um, intervention supporting cognition would be you know, related to the child's cognitive ability when they enter the intervention, but we don't see that association there. Um, so it seems to be that language ability is unique in how it's related to the effectiveness uh, of intervention and whether or not a child can, can benefit from it or finds it useful. We don't see that language ability really significantly moderates intervention effects on play, 
or adaptive behavior. And it's possible that we just had too few studies that reported this. So we, so there might be a true association between these things, but we just couldn't see it because we didn't have enough studies. Um, or it's possible that language is really not very influential in these areas of development. That's also a possibility. Meta-analysis gives us a picture, but the picture can be blurry. And so it's not a definitive answer. It's one piece of information that we wanna look at when we look across all of these things. So how should our intervention recommendation shift? How should we kind of take all of this information into account when we make recommendations for families um, and children uh, that have received um, an autism diagnosis? So first we should stop making blanket recommendations. So the evidence is not strong enough to support these standard recommendations for 40 or even 25 hours per week as unilaterally more effective than less. This is a very common intervention recommendation that is often touted as being evidence-based, which we are just not seeing the evidence for. Um, and so we want to get rid of these kind of blanket intervention recommendations. Next, we need to center the family. So we want to provide natural supports that enhance family functioning in the context of their daily routines rather than interrupting it. So anything where we're taking a child out of their, out of the context in which they would otherwise be, whether it be in the home with the family or out in the community, at school, um, you know, in the, at the park, for example, um, that's interrupting family functioning. Um, and it's not really centering the family. So all of our supports need to be geared towards helping the family kind of live as they'd like to live and helping the child navigate their environment as they want to, to navigate it. We need to center the child. So as part of centering the child, we need to consider the amount of time that it's developmentally appropriate for a young child to be engaged in a specific activity, even if that activity is fun. Um, and then base our recommendations on that. So I'm a parent of young children and I, I don't think I could find 20 hours in their week for them to do one single thing, even if that thing was fun for them. You know, let's say they like, they like art, they like to paint, right? I don't think they need to be painting for 20 hours. Even if it's something they enjoy, it can be just way too much. Um, and so we need to think about, you know, how much time is it developmentally appropriate for a young child to be engaged with one activity um, and, and base our recommendations in part on that. And then encourage collaboration. So when service providers are not collaborated or when we're kind of consistently recommending one kind of service provider over other service providers, we're really not meeting the whole needs of the family and the child. Um, and we have, you know, sort of fragmented services that are provided separately. We have, uh, you know, different service providers kind of coming in through the home. It's kind of like a revolving door of service providers that causes a lot of stress. For, for children and families. And families actually often report that that's a greater source of stress for them than the needs of their child. And so that's an indication that these sort of interventions, services, and supports aren't actually supportive um, when they're causing the family stress and the child stress. So those are kind of our overall recommendations. And I'm gonna sort of stop my screen sharing now and um, see if we have any sort of questions um, to talk about. Hi. Yes, we do. And um, we have one from Kevin Patton. And then I actually have a few myself. And I hope if anyone else has questions, please ask. Um, okay, so Kevin had asked, um, lower, lower slash higher intensity interventions speak to the invasiveness or intense focus of the intervention. Can a short intervention be an intensive intervention? That's a great question. Oh, I love that question. Um, so in some cases, um, uh, higher intensity interventions may speak to the intense fo focus of the intervention, but in some cases, in the studies that we looked at, the intensive interventions were comprehensive interventions, meaning they were targeting a real, a really high variety of of outcomes, um, and maybe and maybe using using a variety of packages. We call these package interventions, right? So it's not just that they're just doing one activity over and over again, but they're, you know, doing this kind of activity and they're supporting in this kind of way and they're teaching, you know, about all of these different kinds of things. But it's just the total amount of time that the children were engaged or receiving that intervention was pretty high. And of course, that number is inflated by the duration of the study. So if it was a study for two years and for three years, even if it was a relatively low 
um, dose frequency. So we had some studies where maybe it was five hours a week, um, but you know, the study went on for six years. Um, and so, right, so that's, that would be, and even five hours, I would say is a pretty high amount of time, right? But, but that, that would also, you know, lead to pretty high intensity, um, cumulative intervention intensity. Um, can, so, so can you say that last part of the question again? Is it? So he's asking, can, if a short intervention, meaning in duration, be a, an intense intervention? Yeah, I mean, I think if we if we're talking about um, dose frequency, so how much uh, intervention is is um, offered per week, um, uh, I would call those if it's like twenty five to forty hours, but maybe the study only went for twelve weeks. Um, I would still call that a pretty high intensity intervention. Um, what I'd love to look at across the studies is if dose frequency is related to intervention effects? I suspect that it's not. Um, but again, we're kind of limited in how we can look at things um, in terms of answering our question. So a lot of times dose frequency wasn't reported. Um, so it, it is, we have to be able to extract enough information from enough studies to actually see the full picture. Um, and so that is, that is a thing that I think we're going to be looking at what sort of dosage information, uh, is reported in a study. Um, and, you know, do we report dose, dose frequency and total duration, um, or, you know, is less there. Um, but yeah, I do think that, you know, a short duration intervention can be very high intensity, but when you look at the recommendations that are given to families, apart from what we see in studies, I think the common recommendation is very high dose frequencies, so 20 to 40 hours per week. And I can, you know, cite kind of like a guiding resource that, that is referenced for that for long durations, for a minimum of two to three years is, is part of that. And so that's why we were really interested, not just because we could extract that number from the studies, but also because this is a recommendation that is in the literature that I see a lot of um, pediatricians kind of relying upon. Yeah. We, we've seen the same. And I was so happy that not only did you mention whether effects were meaningful to the child, um, but also the way that you pointed out that um, there's really no good research for earlier being better um, because so many parents beat themselves up either A, you know, if they couldn't access a service that was being recommended, or even if it wasn't recommended, just you know, if they're worried that they did something wrong. Um, I think that's so huge because I've said this to other guests as well, but, you know, parents are put in a state of fear when they, when their child gets diagnosed, not, ne not even related to the fact that the child has a disability, but because of all the messaging out there of, you know, act now and you have to intervene and, it's very scary. You feel all of a sudden like you don't know how to parent your own child. You're getting all these recommendations. And I was so happy to see your study because for me, an important conversation is um, talking about the fact that early intervention may be helpful and it may not be helpful. And, but nobody talks to us about things. No, no one says, okay, you have these five options. Here are the pros and cons of these options. Here's the evidence base, the real evidence base for each of these. And so you're kind of, you kind of end up just like in the mud, feeling a bit powerless and overwhelmed and, and, you know, and so I'm wondering who, is there, is there a body that oversees um, the recommendations that are given out and the relation to what the evidence actually is? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's one body. And I, I love the opportunity to kind of talk about this um, age uh, uh, intervention effectiveness association or non-association again, because I think, you know, there's potential for misinterpretation and I'm okay. not saying that young children shouldn't have access to support. Right, right. Um, but we should ensure that it's supportive. 
right? And so if families are, are finding it burdensome and stressful and, you know, uh, kind of feeling like, um, you know, they, you like know, it's a race against time. Yes, a race against time. That's going to disrupt family functioning. And in early childhood, we often talk about this model for early development, the ecological model, where children are developing in these contexts. They're developing in the context of their family. The family is operating in the community. The community is operating in you know the city and the state, right? And and the the any sort of positive or negative impacts on those bubbles in which the child is developing can you know, kind of influence the child's development. And so in early intervention and early childhood special education, we talk a lot about supporting the family because the child is developing within the family. So anything that's going to negatively impact the family, disrupt family functioning, and that includes stress, is something we we want to get away from and we don't want to do that we want to positively uh support them and i think this kind of constant you know um earlier it's it's not just that folks are saying that earlier is better they're almost saying um later is too late um yeah. Yeah. and that also has implications when we think about who has access to diagnosis right, right? so when folks are you know when children are are not getting diagnosed until later ages do families feel like well, everybody's telling me it's too late. I can't support my child. Um, that is, you know, uh, something that we we want to consider as well. Um, and so I think it's important to say absolutely young children should have, have access to supports. Families with children who are diagnosed at a young age should have access to the supports they need. And so should families whose children are diagnosed at or earlier ages. And all of those interventions or therapies or services should be actually supportive and not adding additional stress to the family in any way. Is there a governing body? No, I mean, I think the closest thing that I can think of is the American Academy of Pediatrics. I think that, you know, when you think about who's interfacing with the family and sort of the first to kind of point them in the direction of services and supports, um, there is the state with early intervention services if they are um, diagnosed before the age of three. But a lot of times the first point of contact is a pediatrician. Um, and so I think the American Academy of Pediatrics, they recently did kind of a, a review of the evidence as they saw it and made a lot of recommendations. And that was a very yeah. thorough and interesting review but I kind of disagreed with it a bit in terms of, I think without saying it, they implied that more intensive intervention produces unilaterally, you know, better effect. Right, right. And I simply, I, I don't see that when I look at the studies. Um, and so that was kind of our, um, in that, I think I had a, a citation at the top of those last slides. Um, I'm citing a, a commentary we wrote for JAMA Pediatrics um, where we made those recommendations. And it was um, sort of a, a response to that, but also an attempt to reach the first providers because pediatricians are very busy. They have a lot to keep up with, right? They're, they're not just following you know, recommendations for early supports for, for autism, but also other things, right? Um, I wanted to get out like kind of a quick overview of like, hey, we've looked at the evidence and we just want you to know this um, so that they can know. And we pulled out kind of like, hey, did you know that this 40 hours per week came from a study that was published a long time ago that wasn't, you know, where participants weren't randomly assigned and it's one study. Um, you know, I think a lot of pediatricians don't know that. They've heard that from people they trust. They've heard that from, you know, right. the American Academy of Pediatrics. And they don't realize that that's not really based in the sort of evidence that they would expect it to be based in um, for, you know, other medical uh, interventions or supports. Um, so I think that was our, our goal in targeting um, pediatricians and the AAP. Um, but I think there's a variety of kind of bodies that are that are influential in trying to, you know, point point clinicians and providers and families towards, you know, what's the next step? Um, and that happened, that's happening at the state level, it's happening in the United States. And then there is also global recommendations, right? And so that's, you know, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah it really is. Um, okay, we have another question from Lisa Van Hofwagen. Was language ability at the beginning of intervention defined in any detail? Was pre-linguistic <laughs> development taken into account in the studies you looked at? <laughs> 
Yeah, so I'm glad to get the opportunity to clarify that as well. So this is a tricky thing as well. So we we coded language age equivalent, and the and this is something that is commonly computed from early developmental assessments like the Mullen scales of early learning or something like that. Um, and it is an age equivalent in months relative to typical development, which I want to like acknowledge that there are a lot of problems with that kind of measure. Um, mm -hmm. What the issue in that is that with meta-analysis, if we want to look at this, um, we need some sort of score and we need a score that is harm is harmonized across studies. And so our desire to look at this was one, because, you know, we've seen a lot of discussion uh, about, you know, people say, well, that's your intervention recommendation for this child, but what about my child? They're non-speaking, what, you know, right? And right. so there's definitely a lot of discussion about like language ability as being potentially an important factor um, influencing what our intervention recommendations should be. But we knew we had to look at that in a way where we could actually do the math um, and so we needed a score that was going to be harmonized. So we knew a lot of um, intervention studies were going to have reported language ability. And it's really not a lot. I mean, I think, I think there are a lot of studies that didn't report anything that we could extract in that way. Um, but that's why we took those scores as representative language ability. In, and we took, when we could, we took total language age scores. Um, so that was representing kind of um, how much children were understanding as well as how much children were um, speaking and using language and speech. Um, and then we, uh, if we couldn't, then we would either take just their expressive, so how much they were speaking or their receptive, how much they were understanding, just so we could get that score. That isn't to say that all of those other things, I mean, I, I teach a, a communication intervention class for, for, you know, clinicians who are getting ready to work with very young children and pre-linguistic communication um, and, you know, those sort of early developmental indicators of uh, social communication development, of language development, I think are very important and very valuable and should be supported. Mm -hmm. um, and as well as, you know, communication via any means, right? I think it's really important to provide AAC early in life um, so that a child can navigate their environment. And I, and I also often tell students there's, there's no reason to think that AAC would be anything but helpful. I think a lot of practitioners right now have this kind of um, non-evidence-based idea that yeah. um, AAC is going to prevent speech. But we, we actually see the opposite, that if a child is going to develop um, spoken language in, in their, their life, that AAC will be a, a developmental support for that. Mm -hmm. But also if they don't, that's okay too. Yeah. And they need access to, to communicative supports. So I just want to say, you know, I, I recognize that there are limitations when we talk about language ability as being really important as preferencing speaking and spoken language, um, potentially and implicitly. Um, uh, and really just kind of saying, you know, we were looking at this because we thought it would be potentially important and also because that was the, the way we could do the math. It's much harder to, 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 to see these associations, to see this picture, if we're trying to look at different categories of children, like children who are pre-linguistic, children who are AAC users, children who are speaking, you know, um, in full sentences, right? Like that would give us a very different and fuzzier picture than if we have this score that we can look at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I know we're going to have to wrap up soon, but I actually uh, wanted to ask you. So, um, you you and your fellow labs um, also had looked into um, adverse effects and things like that. And I think like so we we speak to a lot of autistic adults who tell us things that like you wouldn't like people wouldn't necessarily assume that X could lead to this particular adverse effect. Like, so for instance, we had a webinar with three people who were talking about um, like never being allowed to say that they can't do something. So, you know, like, so if an intervention is, is saying, um, you know, like we can get the child to do X and that's like the level of success. However, long-term 
you know, people are telling us, well, that was really problematic because it stressed me out. It traumatized me, or, you know, I felt like I could never advocate for myself. Um, so a, could you just tell us a little more about what you found about whether those things, those types of things are even being measured. And then do you think that even if they, even if adverse effects are taken into account, again, who's kind of like at the wheel deciding what could be an adverse effect? Like are autistic people being involved? Are they going to be involved? Because it's like how we're doing all this research and you know, for so long it's been done without them. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, those uh, those studies, uh, one, I'm, I'm not, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just confusing her studies again. Yes, the Adverse Effects and Events and Harms study was led by Dr. Kristen Bottomo-Butel, who is um, of the Acer Lab at Boston College, um, and also a great friend and a wonderful scholar. Um, but she really led those. And I think one of the things that she found was that there is, and I, I think I could say this just from like, living in this world is that there there is this pervasive assumption that inter, that intervention and early intervention and supports cannot be harmful yeah. and that they can't have negative <laughs> effects and it's something I talk to my students my clinician their future clinicians is you know one of the first things we say is like could early intervention cause harm and I really want to kind of walk them through that to say absolutely yeah. and there's really no reason to kind of situate ourselves or center ourselves as like heroes who are, you know, uniformly doing good, right? When you start with that perception, you know, there's so much harm that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I think one of the issues is that because of that pervasive assumption, um, adverse events um, and effects and harms aren't tracked in studies. So even just of our, of our studies within our study duration, we're not seeing um, a lot of good um, tracking of it, even though Kristen then found evidence of it. Um, and one of those is looking at, you know, are there studies that show significant negative effects where the intervention group is, is doing, you know, more poorly relative to the comparison group with the inter intervention. And we found that when we looked in randomized control trials, 11% of studies approximately, I'm going off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it was 11% okay. of studies had evidence of at least one significant negative effect um and so that's substantial i mean like a tenth of studies are having like negative yeah. effects, like with a yikes right <laughs> um so that so that's evidence um you know uh attrition you know substantial attrition we're hearing some studies where you know uh there's a lot of of families leaving you know and that i think is you know your other indicator yeah. of like you're not finding this supportive right so, so there are ways to kind of get at that question, even if it hasn't been tracked or reported. And I think Kristen tried to do that. And I think her, her study was unique. I think it was the first ever, you know. Yeah, I've never seen anything else of that. Um, but the other thing we're finding is that studies don't follow up long term. So I, my doctoral student, Jenna Crank, is now looking at just what are the, what are the long-term studies? Um, and she defined long-term as six months or more, because that's what she had to, like how, how many studies after intervention is over, right. um, have followed up at least six months past. And I think, I mean, there's, there's definitely less than 20. Um, and then when you look even further, like 12 months, then you're, you're getting to like 10, right? There's very few studies. And the longest we have after the intervention is over is like six years. So if we wanted to look at if are adverse events, adverse effects, harms, part of what we would need to do is just follow participants for long enough in the first place to look at if, if it is possible that, you know, those interventions have adverse effects that, you know, really aren't apparent until down yeah. the line. Um, and so, I mean, I think that, I think those studies are important to do, but they're also going to take a long time so yeah. I think in the meantime, we really need to kind of go back and really just start at the beginning and, and reconceptualize, like, can interventions and supports be harmful? Yes, we need to keep that in mind. How do we, you know, uh, uh, ensure that we're not? Well, we need to constantly be reflecting on our practice, engaging with the communities that, you know, are the intended beneficiaries of the intervention, 
listening to them, you know, even when it is uncomfortable and I'm very familiar with that, you know, (laughs) oh, I, I'm, ah, this is not good. I'm not doing something that's helpful. It turns out what I thought was helpful wasn't helpful. Right. Um, And that, that's uncomfortable, but it's, it's necessary. Um, And so I think that's, that's kind of what we need to do. Yeah. Um, I completely agree. And I'm so, it makes me so reassured and hopeful to see people like you and your teams doing this sort of work because it's so overdue and it's really empowering for the families and for autistic people, because it's like people care about these issues and, you know, all the, all the things that people go through. And it's like, it's, it's, it's very validating, I think, to the community for your team and, you know, the other, uh, awesome researchers that you work with, because um, I think that people feel seen. And so, you know, that's really important. I'm very glad. I think we still have more work to do, not just in terms of research questions, but also in terms of, you know, personal reflection and interrogation and saying, oh, let's do better. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. I think, I think what you have all done for the field will lead to some hopefully major changes, even if they are starting out slowly right now, but, you know, being able to share this with other people is a a great step forward. So thank you so much. Um, I, I just think everything that you're all doing is, is really wonderful. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so that's it for today, everybody. So, uh, we will be back next week. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you then.